In Cuba, the high-level delegation for the Colombian peace talks recognized the legitimacy of the delegation of the National Liberation Army and activated protocols for the resumption of the talks in Havana. In Mexico, a series of fires in the Department of Baja California left a total of 19 vehicles destroyed. The events are attributed to organized crime groups. Thousands of people gathered in central Seoul on Saturday to stage a protest calling the South Korean government to suspend its hostile policy towards North Korea and China, including joint military exercises with the United States. Hello, welcome to From the South. I'm Luis Alberto Matos from the Telesur Studios in Havana, Cuba. We'll begin with the news. In Cuba, the high-level delegation for the peace talks in Colombia recognized the intervention of the ELN delegation and activated the protocols for the resumption of the talks in Havana. In this regard, the director of the Inter-Ecclesiastic Commission for Justice and Peace, Danilo Rueda, announced that the government recognized the legitimacy of the delegation of dialogues of the National Liberation Army in the search for peace. Both parties emphasize that the resumption of negotiations seeks to demonstrate the willingness of Bogota and the ELN to seek a sustainable peace. In this sense, Reda asserted that the Colombian government will adopt all political measures to guarantee the necessary conditions to restart the contacts. This government officially announces that it recognizes the legitimacy of the dialogue delegation of the National Liberation Army, ELN, in the search for peace. Secondly, the government of Colombia will adopt all political and legal measures within the framework of domestic and international law to guarantee the conditions that will permit the resumption of talks with the ELN, including the recognition of the protocols in this context, the director of the inter Commission for Justice and Peace, Daniel Rueda, assured that the ELN is willing to resume peace talks with the government. We have confirmed that the ELN shares the Colombian government's desire for peace, that they are listening to the voices of multiple sectors of society, that from the territories and different instances are clamoring for a solution to the armed conflict through dialogue. In the meetings held, the delegation has announced that the ELN will take the necessary steps to resume the talks. The parties agree on the need to reinitiate a process of dialogue with facts that demonstrate to Colombian society and to the world that this will is real. Likewise, Commissioner Danilo Rueda thanked the largest of the Antilles for its hospitalities and the accompaniment of international representatives to resume peace in Colombia and the world. We are grateful once again for the hospitality and the strong commitment of the Cuban people and government to peace in Colombia. A commitment that was personally expressed today by its president, Miguel Díaz Canel. We're also grateful for the efforts of Carlos Ruiz, Special Representative of the Secretary General of the United Nations in Colombia, of John Otobrov, Special Envoy of the Kingdom of Norway, guarantor of these dialogues, and of Monsignor Hector Fabio Enao, Delegate of the Catholic Church. We, the participants in this first meeting, are committing to doing our best to foster the stable, lasting and sustainable peace that Colombia and humanity deserve. Revolutionaries around the world are celebrating this Saturday, the 96th birthday of Fidel Castro, the historic leader of the Cuban Revolution. In Cuba and Latin America, Fidel Castro is considered the father of the revolution for the social transformations and people's sacrifice in their resistance against the economic, financial, and commercial blockade imposed by the United States for more than half a century. Fidel continues to be an icon in the struggles of Cubans to preserve unity and sovereignty and is remembered as the greatest universal symbol of emancipation and anti-imperialist ideas whose legacy still remains in force in all of the peoples of Latin America. On this patriotic date, 
Through his account on the social network Twitter, the president of Cuba, Miguel Diaz Canel Bermudez, expressed happy birthday, dear Fidel. We feel you among us in the challenging hours of the last days and in the inalienable dreams of always. We follow your footsteps. We will win. Also, Twitter user Idris Fernandez Venero wrote, Today will be 96 years of life, our eternal commander, Fidel Castro Cruz, our guide, our leader, our father. So it will be forever for all Cubans. He lives in our hearts. We'll take a short break now. Join us again after this. Welcome back from the south. In Mexico, a series of fires in the Department of Baja California left a total of 19 vehicles destroyed. The events are attributed to organized crime groups. Private cars, public transport, and cargo vehicles were set on fire this Friday in the midst of the wave of violence that has swept through several Mexican states this week. The blockades and fires, which occurred almost simultaneously, took place in main avenues of cities such as Tijuana, Mexicali, Rosarito, and Ensenada, all in Baja California. The events took place one day after the violent day in Ciudad Juarez, Chihuahua, which left 11 dead, 12 wounded, and several businesses and vehicles set on fire. Events that were rejected as unprecedented by President Andrés Manuel López Obrador. Flags flew half mast in Montenegro on Saturday as the country declared three days of mourning following a shooting rampage that killed 11 people on Friday, including the gunman. According to Montenegro police, a 34 year old man entered the home of his tenants in Setinje and killed two children and their mother and then went on out into the street shooting randomly at passersby. Ob obituaries for the victims were posted across Setinje and funerals were expected on Sunday. Six people who were injured were taken to hospitals and three of them are still in a serious condition in intensive care. Eyewitnesses said the situation was chaotic as the gunman went on a rampage through the streets. According to preliminary information, a policeman was also injured in a gun battle with the shooter before a civilian shot the gunman dead. In Ukraine, authorities in Zaporizhia denounced a new Kiev shelling of the city's nuclear power plant. According to the spokesman of the city's civil military administration, Vladimir Rogov, the Ukrainian troops again shelled the city of Energodar and the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. This follows another attack by Kiev on Friday on a nuclear facility, which caused a fire in a hydrogen pipeline affecting the equipment of reactor 3 and 4 of the plant. The Zaporizhia nuclear power plant has been under the control of the Russian armed forces since March, which have been ordered to protect the plant against possible attacks. For his part, the permanent representative of Russia to the United Nations Organization visiting Venezia warned that if a catastrophe occurs at the separation nuclear power plant, all responsibility will fall on the Western sponsors of Ukraine. The Venetian Forum pointed out that if the Ukrainian attacks on the facility continue, Ukraine, Russia, Belarus, Moldova, Bulgaria, Romania, and the self-proclaimed republics of Donetsk and Lugansk would be affected. The Russian diplomat also urged representatives of the International Atomic Energy Agency to visit the separation nuclear power plant as soon as possible. In Russia, the Beijing embassy in Moscow expects the value of trade between the two nations to rise to 200 billion US dollars this year. Economic ties between Russia and China are showing steady growth despite the difficult international situation. Beijing's ambassador to Moscow said on Friday, predicting that trade could reach 200 billion US dollars this year. In the first seven months of the year, trade between Moscow and Beijing increased by 29%, reaching $97.71 billion. The ambassador said, citing data from China Customs, listing some of the priorities for bilateral trade, he highlighted energy, nuclear power, aviation, space, basic infrastructure, as well as digital technology, medicine, green energy, agriculture, and science and innovation, among other sectors. 
Supporters of the opposition leader Raila Odinga took to the streets of Nairobi Saturday to celebrate after official election no, results showed him leading Kenya's presidential elections. Officials at the Electoral and Boundaries Commission are still counting votes on tight security while Raila Odinga's running mate Mark Fakaru already declared Odinga's victory at a press conference. Kenyans had been left confused when television stations that had been providing calling coverage of the election suddenly stopped broadcasting provisional results on Thursday. The election is being seen as a test of the stability of the East African powerhouse, which has seen past votes marred by rigging and deadly violence. To win outright, a candidate needs more than half of all votes and at least 25% of the votes in more than half of Kenya's 47 counties. Patience pace. We have waited for Raila Modu Odinga's uh, presidency for many years and finally it is here. This will inspire the generations to come. We have taken the first step in transforming Kenya. We have much more to do. And therefore today is just telling ourselves, you may be feeling the fatigue of the last four months because we were not sleeping, we were live, living and sleeping and dreaming just the campaign. It is exhausting, but let your mind recharge because we've got more work to do. I will have more news coming up after a final short break, so don't go away. Welcome back to From the South. Thousands of people gathered in Central Seoul on Saturday to stay a protest calling on the South Korean government to suspend its hostile policy towards North Korea and China, including joint military exercises with the United States. Protesters demanded the government suspend military cooperation between Seoul and Washington and push for a peace treaty and cooperation with Pyongyang. The rally took place near the historic Namdaem Gate, about 2.5 kilometers from the presidential office. Participants marched towards the office after taking part in a protest. Hell in rain, the rally caused severe traffic congestion. Taliban fighters beat women protesters and fired into the air on Saturday as they violently dispersed a rare rally in the Afghan capital, days ahead of the first anniversary of the hardline Islamist return to power. About 40 women chanting bread, work and freedom marched in front of the Education Ministry building in Kabul before the firefighters dispersed them by firing their guns into the air. Some women protesters who took refuge in nearby shops were chased and beaten by Taliban fighters with their rifle butts. The protesters carried a banner which read August 15 is a black day as they demanded rights to work and political participation. After seizing power, the Taliban had promised a softer version of the harsh Islamist rule that characterized their first stint in power from 1996 to 2001, but many restrictions have already been imposed. In Spain, one person was killed and dozens were injured when a high wind caused parts of a stage to collapse at a dance music festival. The incident occurred near the Spanish city of Valencia in the early hours of Saturday, regional emergency services said. Authorities report that the man was hit by part of the concert stage that was torn off by the wind. Other infrastructure was also damaged when gusts battered the Medusa Festival, a huge electronic music festival held over six days in the east coast town of Cullera. Of the injured, three suffered serious trauma injuries and 14 had more minor injuries, regional emergency services tweeted. Regional health authorities said later that 40 people were attended to. In the United Kingdom, train drivers start a new 24-hour strike due to the loss of Persian power in the country. In a communique, the British Train Drivers Union defended the measure as a last resort in the face of the refusal of the companies and the United Kingdom government to agree to wage increases for railway workers. The union also assured that the drivers have not received any increase for three years, despite the fact that inflation in the country has exceeded 9% and could exceed 13% in the fall, according to experts. 
The strike called by the ASLEF union was aimed at nine regional operators, some of which cancelled all their traffic, such as Heathrow Express, which takes passengers to the big Heathrow Airport in London. In Japan, over 72,000 people in Shizuoka Prefecture received an evacuation warning due to the impact of heavy rains caused by Typhoon Mary. According to Japan's meteorological agency, the eye of the storm is advancing northwestward across the Pacific Ocean at a speed of 20 km per hour. According to the forecast, Mary is getting closer and closer to the Tokai or Kanto regions, where it is expected to hit the Japanese territory and rainfall will reach 300 and 250 mm respectively. Forecasts warn of strong winds, high waves, and lightning in the mentioned areas, so the authorities advise the population to take measures against possible local storms, tornadoes, landslides, floods, and river floods. Likewise, it is expected that a natural phenomenon will reach the coast of the Ibaraki region in the early hours of Sunday morning and become an extropical hurricane on Monday. In Thailand, residents continue to be evacuated as severe flooding in the north of the country caused by the impact of tropical storm Mulan. Although the country's meteorological department had reported that Mulan had weakened as it entered Yunnan province in China, the storm has caused heavy rains in parts of northern and northeastern Thailand. Among the most affected provinces is Chiang Rai, where rescue squads have been working since Friday night to evacuate people trapped by the floods. Rescuers are also delivering fresh food and drinking water to the affected residents. Also, 15 other provinces in Thailand have been affected with landslides and blocked roads. In Germany, authorities warn of possible environmental disaster in the other river due to the appearance of thousands of dead fish on its banks. The environment minister, Steffi Lemke, demanded a thorough investigation to determine the causes of the disaster while warning that the Polish authorities were aware of the fact and did not notify her. According to sources, fishermen in Poland noticed the first cases of dead fish since July 28th. However, the country's Prime Minister, Mateusz Morawiecki, assured that he found out about the incident on August 9th or 10th. The Prime Minister also pointed out that the level of pollution is very high and that it will take years for the river to return to its natural state. Telesur English continues to grow, it's seen on our races Europe you can order from your cable dealer or tune it yourself. These parameters that you see on screen are in place since July 1st and quite soon further changes will be implemented for the signals in the Middle East and Africa. Now more than ever the world connects to us and our stories are heard of the faraway nations. This new small platform will continue providing truthful content to oppose the hegemonic media's narrative and our faithfulness to our audience. We have come to the end of this news group, and you can find these and many other stories on our website at telesurenglish.net. You can also join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Telegram. For Telesur English, I'm Luis Alberto Matos. Thank you for watching.